Hi, my name is Doug Chang. I'm the Vice President and Executive Creative Director for Lucasfilm, and you are watching 3D VF. Nowadays, you worked on the Star Wars series, right? So the Mandalorian, Skeleton, Skeleton Crew. Crew. Uh, and yeah. Obi-Wan Kenobi. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, all these design philosophies do apply all these years later to all these uh, Star Wars works nowadays? Yes, no, yeah. exactly. And that's what the beauty of it now is, you know, when, when George and I you know, were working on the prequels, he always knew that eventually, you know, those two timelines, those two distinct styles were going to merge. And now we're at the point where we are merging those. Yeah. And so like in the series Mandalorian, you're seeing things, you know, from the prequel eras combined with the original trilogy. Like we have the N1 in there, we have pit droids, you know, from the prequels all the way in, in our series as well. And so now you're really starting to see, okay, the universe that we design is really cohesive. It's all one universe and the designs all work together. What would you say is a successful design in the Star Wars universe, if there is a, a <laughs> formula somewhat? There is kind of guidelines and principles that I use, but there's not anything specific. It's, it's almost like an instinct. Mm. But the rules that I use is that, you know, what makes Star Wars very distinct is that the designs are always iconic and we try to make them as timeless as possible. And in order to achieve that, we always design for the silhouette. We design for the logo, what that shape is, because that is so important. That is the first thing that the audience sees. And then we can layer in details of color and textures and things like that. But you have to capture that initial shape first. Wow. And you can't be too busy. And the way I always look at it is that, you know, imagine that you're a kid, you're a five-year-old child. Can you draw that? How simple can you make it? Yeah. And that's what makes a strong design is you need to distill the designs to its pure essence. And one of the things that we, I do now is that, you know, when I design something and I think it's working, I start to remove elements from it. What you want to do is you want to subtract as much as possible and you start taking pieces away until you remove one piece where it doesn't work anymore and then you put it back. And that's when you know you have the simplest design that will work. And that's the one that you should keep. You didn't work on Endo, but they used a lot of uh, old technological parts like 70s Walkman or something like that. <laughs> yes. And people recognize this stuff. Yes. Uh, do you think they shouldn't recognize the stuff? Because <laughs> nowadays we know how the lightsaber was done with uh, parts from something that was motorized and stuff. But do you think it should be obvious or something unrecognizable? A little bit both. It can't ah. be so obvious that they know that they're like, oh, I had that as a toy. But there should be a point where it's like, oh, it looks kind of familiar. I've seen that before, but I don't quite know. Yeah. And so we use a lot of uh, toys and uh, sort of gadgets from the 1970s and 80s. Uh, so like things like CRT monitors, you kind of know what they are, but we don't repeat them and copy them exactly like, oh, that's my old TV set, <laughs> you know. But there's enough of it where you can actually see like, okay, I see the influence of that. Yeah. That's the, the key to Star Wars. Uh, you don't want to be so obvious that you're, you're using it one-to-one -one because that, that, that's not the, the assignment. Uh, you always have to take it and twist it a little bit, but the foundation is there. Regarding nowadays uh, with AI and stuff, you know, a lot of artists feel like they're robbed of their art because AI is taking stuff from here and there and combining <laughs> yes. it and such a thing. What is your take on AI nowadays? I know, no, it, it's really kind of... Um, interesting where it's going and I've been tracking it quite a bit and and I kind of see it as as good and bad I mean it, it's, it's bad in the sense that it's not art I mean it, it's, it's you shouldn't consider it art it's really just kind of you know collaging in a very sophisticated way uh, but it should never be interpreted as you know art you know because there's no emotion behind it yeah and so that's the difference for me where I see the, its value is that you actually can come up with things that can inspire you you know in terms of lighting and texture and, and stuff that you may not you know, expect and those things are what I would then take and then recreate and hand paint and redesign so that's the value there and in some ways it's kind of like photography when you know portrait painting was such a thing and then photography came in it was such a uh, a groundbreaking thing that you know portrait painters were afraid of, of photography but now it's kind of evolved into something else so I think a similar thing is going to happen I don't want uh, AI art to be considered art I mean it should always be what it is and you know not take away from the artist itself but as a tool, it's here, it exists, it's not going away. So in some ways we have to embrace it, yeah. but it has to be very careful in terms of how you define what that is. And, and it's scary because some of the images that are generated by AI are frighteningly good and they're super fast. Yeah. And it's kind of like, I don't know where this is gonna go. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. As a tool, uh, I'm thinking about virtual productions with the volume and stuff. Do you think nowadays it's been overhyped or is it one of 
several tools that you have to pick and uh, combine with other com techniques to make it work, actually. Yeah, no, it's one of the tool several tools. And, and this is where, you know, in the Mandalorian, you know, even though we, the, a lot of the, sort of the press is about, the, you know, the stagecraft technology and stuff, that's one component of our filmmaking. And it's a key important component because that's what allowed us to get the scope and spectacle of theatrical films for a streaming show, where we're literally producing, you know, up to, you know, three uh, feature films worth of content in about half the time and a third the budget. In order to do that, you need to rely on technology to kind of make it more efficient because there's no way we could produce a series like The Mandalorian and actually go to all these locations. It's just impossible. It would be crazy expensive and, and take too long. So Stagecraft and the LED actually allows us to bring those elements into the studio. So visually, the audience shouldn't be able to tell the difference. You know, as filmmakers, we all know the process and we can use it to our best advantage, but the experience for the audience, the goal is to bring that theatrical quality at this level because the expectation for the audience is so high now. LED is really one component of all this. It's, you know, the way I look at it is like, it's like sound now. It's, it's another tool to use to enhance the storytelling. You've been in, this, in the industry for like uh, 30 plus years <laughs> yes, now. So, I know too long. So, <laughs> so where do you see all this going? What kind of improvements do you think should be on the table uh, for yeah. the coming years? It's a tricky one because I, I think with the, you know, uh, emergent technology, the better we can get at rendering, you know, um, sort of satisfying sort of the director's vision, you know, the better tools that we can develop, the more efficient we can become. Because at the end of the day, you know, our budgets are driven by time, you know, so if it's a long time to do a process, it, that equates to a certain amount of dollars. So if you can shorten that period, then that will reduce the budget. Because at the end, it is a business, so we have to be as efficient as possible. So we always try to find efficiency while trying not to lose the vision of the scope that we want to achieve. So I think where I would love to see this go is that the tools actually become better and better. And one perfect example is uh, digital painting. Mm -hmm. You know, before when I was doing traditional paintings, paper, marker sketches, and acrylic paintings, they were pretty quick, but you could only bring it up to a certain level because they were still very time and stuff and very hard. Uh, and at that time when I was working on Star Wars, I was producing, you know, five fully rendered images a day. You know, but they were black and white images, and I would produce a painting maybe every two or three days, a full color rendering. But now with um, you know, digital paint tools and 3D modeling combining the two, we're actually producing full-on you know, um, paintings, keyframes, fully rendered all there you know, in like, you know, easily in, in several hours. So our efficiency and our productivity has increased quite a bit. So now we're not only producing you know, concept paintings, but we're producing about two or three of these a day per artist. Lately, uh, for quite a few years uh, actually, there's um, talks about the working conditions of the artists, the, the workforce behind the CG. What is your take on that? Because uh, we see studios closing down uh, from day to day and uh, people saying they work long hours. You've worked on long hours in the 90s on the in many projects, yeah. but now it's on a global scale and everyone is competing against each other. Yeah. How do you see that? No, it's, it's, it's really sad and it's unfortunate because computer graphics, visual effects, all the stuff that we do, film design, it's so hard and, and it's not appreciated. Yeah. And that's the frustration is that the artistry that goes into it is, is so precise and it takes a lot of training, a lot of work. Yeah. And it's taken for granted by the studios and the filmmakers. And, and the thing is that you know, the community uh, of artists are so passionate that you know, they want to do it. Even though they know that it's going to be a lifestyle that's very hard on them, that will be working you know, around the clock, they want to do it because they believe in it and they love it. And it's just unfortunate that the industry doesn't re respect um, the craft enough to sort of you know, give the, the proper acknowledgement or the proper budget and the proper you know, time scale to, to work on these. Yeah. And I don't know if that's going to change. I would love for it to change because so far I've been in the you know, film industry now, you know, both in visual effects and the production design and, and uh, pre-production and production. So all phases of, of the production workflow and it hasn't changed. And in the 35 years that I've been here working this, it has not changed at all. And in some ways, you know, it's gotten worse in many areas because I can just see my friends just like, you know, towards the end of every production, it's always the same scramble where you're working around the clock and the last three or four months is just sheer hell. And, and it would be nice if that could change. And I don't know what the answer is. I think, you know, if, if the studios could actually release the pressure of all that, that would help. I think inventing new tools to help make the process more efficient is, is, will definitely go a long way. 
But the irony is that when you create that efficiency, then the expectation goes up. Yeah. And then the money goes down. And yeah. so it, then it balances itself out and you're working crazy hours again. Yeah, with um, uh, movies lately like uh, Avatar, The Way of Water, you see this big step up in quality in CG. And are you like frightened of what that might yeah. imply? Actually? No, I, I, I do. Yeah, like Avatar, oh my God. When I saw that, my eyeballs were falling out of my head because <laughs> it was so amazing. I mean, just the level of work was at a whole new level. But part of me, you know, uh, uh, being in, in the industry is, I, I started to see the pain. I, I knew, I, I kind of can guess how, how much effort it took to get that on screen. Yeah. And so you start to see that, and it's like, oh man, I hope, I hope people are okay. <laughs> you see all these movies uh, that are comp competing for the Oscars, and they're like uh, named for the VFX uh, awards. But while the movies are being uh, advertised, they always say there's no CG inside this movie. You see <laughs> Top Gun 2, like, it was shot in planes and stuff. And why is it nominated in the VFX category then? I know, I know. <laughs> no, that's the frustration is that if we do our job really well, the audience won't recognize it. They'll just enjoy it. And that's the irony is that we always try to make the, our work so seamless with the whole process that, you know, we shouldn't be calling our attention to ourselves. Yeah. But the studio shouldn't recognize that and they should acknowledge it.